أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Then in the next verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا ترفعوا أصواتكم فوق صوت النبي ولا تجهروا له بالقول كجهر بعضكم لبعض أن تحبط أعمالكم وأنتم لا تشعرون O oh, you who believe, in verse number two, do not raise your voices above the voice of the Prophet, nor address him in the manner that you address one another, lest your deeds come to nothing while you are unaware. Now, why was this verse revealed? Again, if you go to, and this is mentioned in, in many, uh, it's mentioned in the Bukhari, it's mentioned even in the Seerah of Ibn Hisham, it's mentioned in Tafsir al-Qurtubi and other sources where this verse was revealed because, as I said, the ninth year of the Hijrah was known as the year of delegations. So after the Prophet conquers Mecca, Tribes, entire clans and tribes join Islam and they come to Medina to pay allegiance to the Prophet. So this year was called the year of delegations, the ninth year after the Hijrah. So what happened was that one of the major tribes, the, the tribe of Banu Tamim, arrives in Medina. What happens is that Abu Bakr and Umar are in the presence of the Prophet and they're arguing with one another as to who should receive this delegation. So they want to appoint someone, they want a point person to kind of look after this delegation. You know, it's not, you have to kind of, uh, these, these are things that, you know, one person cannot handle them. So Abu Bakr and Umar, each of them has someone in mind that they want to appoint. So they start arguing with one another and they start shouting at one another. And the Prophet is trying to make his suggestion and they start yelling and they actually drown out the voice of the Prophet. So, and this is, this is not, by the way, this is not a Shi'i narration. This is mentioned. This is mentioned by many prominent Sunni commentators. This is a very well-known incident. So Abu Bakr and Umar are literally shouting at each they're having a shouting match in the presence of the prophet and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals this verse ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawt an-nabi do not raise your voices above the voice of the prophet the prophet was speaking but umar ibn al-khattab was saying that we should appoint this person Abu Bakr was saying that we should appoint this person. Abu Bakr then says, are you disagreeing with me? And then they, they started to shout at one another. وَلَا تَجْهَرُ لَهُ بِالْقَوْلِ كَجَهْرِ بَعْضِكُمْ لِبَعْضِ أَنْ تَحْبَطَ أَعْمَالُكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ Nor address him. Don't address the Prophet in the same way that you address one another. So you see, the problem is, my dear brothers and sisters, sometimes you have people who disrespect the Prophet. They don't observe proper etiquette because they don't know. They don't know better, right? They're new Muslims. They're new converts. So they don't really understand the nature of the Prophet's authority. They, they are to be taught. There are others who are not newcomers to Islam. Abu Bakr and Umar are not new converts. But because of their excessive familiarity with the Prophet, because the Prophet, you know, they're the father-in-laws of the Prophet, they have a certain connection to him, they, they start to overstep their limits. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rebukes them in this ayah. There's another narration that is mentioned in Tafsir al-Qummi, Ali ibn Ibrahim al-Qummi. This is a Tafsir which is a uh, Tafsir riwa'i. It's a Hadith-based Tafsir of the Qur'an. 
it says that nazalat that these verses these first few verses of surah al hujurat nazalat fi wafdi bani tamim they were revealed about the delegation of tamim the tribe of tamim kanu idha qadimu ala rasulillah when they would come to the prophet and the incident of abu bakr and umar it's all related because so these individuals are newcomers to islam banu tamim and then you have Abu Bakr and Umar arguing and fighting with one, well, with one another as to who should receive the delegation. So this tribe, Banu Tamim, they're new converts to Islam. And they, they, they were not respectful in the way that they interacted with the Prophet. Whenever they would come to the Prophet, they would stand in front of the house of the prophet in front of the private apartments of the prophet the prophet would be inside with one of his wives they would stand out you know try to picture this they would stand outside of his house yelling saying ya muhammad ukhruj ilayna they wouldn't call him the they wouldn't say ya rasulullah they would say oh muhammad come out oh muhammad come out wakana wakanu idha kharaja rasulullah taqaddamuhu fil mashi that when the Prophet would come out to receive them, they would walk in front of the Prophet. So again, one of the meanings of the first verse, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu la tuqaddimu bayna yaday Allahi wa rasulid that do not advance before God and His Messenger. One of the meanings is literally don't walk in front of Him. Don't be rude. Don't be disrespectful. This is the Messenger of God. وَكَانُوا إِذَا كَلَّمُوهُ رَفَعُوا أَصْوَاتَهُمْ فَوْقَ صَوْتِهِ So Abu Bakr and Umar, they raised their voices in the presence of the Prophet. Allah rebukes them. He admonishes them for this. Banu Tamim, they also used to raise their voices in the, in the presence of the Prophet. يَقُولُونَ When they would have questions, they would say, يَا مُحَمَّدْ يَا مُحَمَّدْ مَا تَقُولُ فِي كَذَا وَكَذَا Oh Muhammad, oh Muhammad, what is your opinion about such and such issue? كَمَا يُكَلِّمُونَ بَعْضُهُمْ بَعْضًا So they would, they would talk to the Prophet in the same way that they would talk with their friends. They would, they would, they would mention him by his naked name. They wouldn't mention him by addressing him as the Messenger of God. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals these verses to teach the Muslims how to treat the Prophet. Number one, do not advance before God and His Messenger. You're not, you're not entitled to an opinion after God and His Messenger have put forward a commandment, number one. And literally, you know, don't walk in front of Him, don't pray in front of Him, whatever it may be. Number two, do not raise your voice in the presence of the Prophet. Because if you do that, there is a severe consequence. And tahbata a'amalukum wa antum la tashurum. There are some sins, brothers. You know, brothers and sisters, when you commit a sin, most of the sins that you commit are not going to wipe out all of your good deeds. So, for example, if I pay charity and I pray salatul layl and I do all of these good deeds, but let's say. I look at a non-mahram lustfully. I committed a sin. But that sin is not going to make all of my good deeds null and void. It's a sin, but it's not a sin that is of, of, a such, of such a serious nature that it completely nullifies all of my past deeds. But disrespecting the prophet is not only a sin now look at how severe and what a serious offense it is to disrespect the prophet to behave coarsely with the prophet that not only are you committing a sin but all of your good deeds that you did all of your qiyam laid everything is wiped out so when Abu Bakr and Umar, when they raised their voices in the presence of the Prophet, all of their good deeds in the past, Allah says they're wiped out. They're wiped out. Now the reason why I'm mentioning these individuals is because 
you know, the intention here is not to offend people. But we have to understand we cannot blindly admire people. Nor should we blindly demean or make disparaging remarks that we have to we have to examine personalities through the lens of the Quran. We elevate people who the Quran has elevated. And we lower people who the Quran has lowered. So those who raise their voices in the presence of the Prophet, not only is it a sin, but it eradicates and it nullifies all of their, their good deeds. And this, why does Allah, why is Allah so severe when it comes to this issue? Because there are dangerous consequences to undermining the Prophet. And we see this today. On the when we speak about the calamity of Thursday, when the Prophet asked for a pen and paper and his request was undermined, we're still suffering today. Until today, in 2019, all of the deviation that we see around the world is because someone undermined the Prophet when he was on his deathbed and did not allow him to write his wasiyah. What we see around the world today, the suffering of the Ummah is because the words of the Prophet in Ghadir were undermined. This is why Allah is very strict when it comes to how we behave with the Prophet. Because the moment you open this door of disrespect and you undermine the Prophet, you're going to lead people to their own destruction. That you're going to, they're going to miss out they're going to be deprived of prophetic guidance if the Prophet is undermined. So don't address the Prophet in the way that you address one another. Now after this verse was revealed, and we'll conclude here, after this ayah was revealed, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَجْهَرُهَ لَهُ بِالْقَوْلِ كَجَهَرِ بَعْضِكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ Don't address the Prophet in the way that you address each other. After this ayah was revealed, people suddenly were very cautious. They would always address the Prophet as Ya Rasulullah. Even Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam started to address her father as Ya Rasulullah. Now, when the Prophet saw that Fatima to Zahra was addressing him, saying, O Messenger of God, the Prophet said to her that. Bunayya Fatima, O oh my daughter Fatima, this verse, this commandment does not apply to you. There is nothing more dear to my heart than for you to call me Abata, than for you to call me my father. Everyone else has to address me as Ya Rasulullah. But you, you're my daughter. You are the only one who is permitted to refer to me as Ya Abata, O my beloved Father. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi al-tahireen. Now, when it comes to um, sins being wiped out for, uh, or sins wiping out your good deeds, it, it seems like a lot of these sins are, I mean, there's multiple sins that are said to do that. And it seems like those are the ones that are really taking you, I guess, kind of, are you take, take, get, getting you in a path that will make it harder for you to get be, to be redeemed later. Is, is that, does that sound accurate? Or can it, you it, it, it's, on that? So th there are certain sins that are, are detrimental in the sense that they can uh, they can nullify they can make your past good deeds null and void and they also affect the acceptance of future deeds so for example if some we have a hadith that say if someone glares at his parents with anger allah will not accept their prayers now this doesn't mean that salah is not wajib on you anymore what it means is that that the thawab the reward for the prayers that you perform moving forward will be drastically reduced until you repent and ask them for forgiveness. 
So, and, and you find that a lot of these sins are related to how you treat other people. So, for example, you know, when you backbite, when you backbite, you know, what happens is that, you know, you're, you essentially donate, your, 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 your good deeds are transferred to the people that you uh, backbite against. And if, if you run out of good deeds, you inherit their sins. So, when you look at the, 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 uh, the actions, the sins that are most detrimental, oftentimes, they are the sins where you're oppressing or you're wronging other people. And in this case, when you're, you're, you're wronging the Prophet, you are committing an act of injustice to the Prophet by not honoring him in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked you to honor him. Now, is it difficult to redeem yourself? Nothing is difficult if you sincerely repent. So if someone commits this action, yes, your good deeds are wiped out. But if you repent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His infinite mercy, He may restore you know, uh, your, your previous record. But if you don't repent, yeah, that's the, that's the, the type of damage that you've done. So it's important for us not to, to, to fall into despair. That if you commit a sin and your good deeds are wiped out, it doesn't mean that that's it, you're doomed. The door of repentance is, is always open. But you have to also, you know, repent. The problem is, you know, shaitan is also very tactful in the sense that when you commit sins, you know, not only does shaitan motivate you to sin, he also is very skilled in the art of convincing you to delay repentance. You know, that sometimes we commit a sin. You know, many of us on a daily basis, we miss Salatul Fajr. And some of us, we consciously miss Salatul Fajr. We don't even put an alar alarm clock. Not only do you have to make up the qada, you know, some of us think that, oh, you know, we, we have five years of qada to make up. And, and we're making up those qada prayers. It's not sufficient to just make up the prayers. You actually have to repent because you committed a sin by missing those prayers. So when you miss an obligatory prayer, you have two obligations. You have to make up the prayer and you have to also repent. You have to make tawbah. And sometimes we forget that we have to make tawbah. So this is you know, something that I think we, we have to pay attention to. That yes, certain sins may nullify your past deeds, but you can inshallah restore those good deeds through sincere repentance. Hopefully that was food for thought, inshallah, for all of us. Uh, a lot, a lot, certainly. And we're looking forward to hearing the rest of these series and learning from your wisdom. Inshallah, it's, it's all the wisdom of the Quran and the Ahmed Bayt. I'm just, I'm just the, uh, I'm just the delivery dude. <laughs> inshallah, may, may Allah so much, subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. Keep me in your du'a and inshallah we'll meet, uh, we'll meet again inshallah next week. Inshallah. Thank you so much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.